Thanks, Pastor Dave. Great song to end with as we begin this text because it's a good segue from last Sunday's message. I don't know if you remember or not, but 624 in Matthew. If you take your Bibles and open up to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be starting with verse 25 today. But verse 24 from last week talked about um, you can't serve two masters. We either love one and be devoted to the other or hate one and, be, and uh, love the other. And uh, he ends that section because basically we are either going to serve uh, God or serve money. And who you serve, who you invest in, will have all the difference in the world by whether or not you have cares and worries and anxiety in this world. This text is absolutely huge, especially if you understand that um, several medical reports have been done over the last several decades to show that 80% of all doctor visits can be traced back to stress or anxiety or worrisome uh, attitudes. 80%. 80%. We could save health care costs in the United States exponentially if we just, tr- as a nation, trust Jesus. Listen very, very carefully. Um, just a second. Buddy's going to come up and read this text. There are three therefores. Your NIV text only has two. Um, verse uh, 25 and verse 34, there are therefores there. But there actually could have been one. And in some texts, some translations, there is in verse 30 where it says, so, or I'm sorry, 31, so do not worry. Anytime you have a therefore in the scripture text, you need to know why the therefore is there, what the therefore is there for. Um, It's there for a reason. (laughs) I can't get away from it now. (laughs) In verse 25, he says, don't worry because you've made God your master. You've invested in God. So you've invested in God, made God your master, therefore do not worry. In verse 31, um, you understand that the, clothes, the, the, the flowers of the field are clothed, you understand that the birds of the air are fed, you understand that they don't worry, so why are you worrying? Therefore you don't need to worry. Verse uh, 34, you understand that you see, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, make that first and foremost in your life, therefore you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Listen very, very carefully as Buddy reads this text, Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Good morning. Good morning. Seems to me if our Savior is dead and buried, we have everything to worry about. Hmm. But if the tomb is empty, we have nothing to worry about. Amen. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink about your body, what you will wear? Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lily of the fi- lilies of the field are grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. It's the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This text is huge. Um, Not only because it's a big American problem that we worry so much, but it's one that I think is hurting our witness um, immensely. I remember uh, listening to a message one time, and uh, the, the pastor was talking about uh, this particular passage and talking about how the Sermon on the Mount was asking people to consider that um, if they are angry with their brother, they've really committed murder. If they think lustful thoughts after uh, some uh, female, then that person, that guy, has actually committed adultery in his heart. And so he asked the people, how many of you uh, are murderers, to raise your hand? And 
only one or two people who had the courage to raise their hand that they were a murderer. And I asked the people, how many of you are adulterers? And again, only one or two people were willing to raise their hands. And then he said, how many of you worry? And almost every hand raised up. Please understand that in the Sermon on the Mount and pretty much throughout Jesus' teaching in general, he is much harsher on those who worry than on murderers and adulterers. In the Sermon on the Mount itself, much more time is given by Jesus to help us to understand how we're killing ourselves and hurting ourselves by worrying than the time he gives to murder and adultery. Now, a lot of you are saying, Pastor Keith, you can't be serious. I'm dead serious. It is our culture. It is our value systems of 21st century America that have put worry on something that, oh, yeah, I worry, so what? But we fail to understand what our worrying really signifies. You don't trust God when you worry. And Jesus is head-on attacking that in this area because he wants you to have life. He wants you to live life. Not with the kind of half-baked life that we have because we worry and take, our, take the life out of us by our worrying. That's why this little song is very, very appropriate and it accomplished exactly what I wanted it to do in the first service. In order to do the full deal, I'm trying to create a hook and hopefully this week you will whistle and sing this little ditty to remind you not to forget about God and to don't worry and be happy. Listen. Can you feel it? If you listen to the words of Jesus throughout the Sermon on the Mount, that should be exactly where we are. He began the Sermon on the Mount by saying, supremely, divinely happy are you if you mourn about your sinfulness. Supremely, divinely happy are you if you hunger and thirst after righteousness. Supremely, divinely happy are you if you're poor in spirit. And a lot of you have really embraced those early uh, thoughts by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount because you feel poor in spirit. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're mourning after the fact that you're not the Christian you should be. Folks, that's exactly what Jesus wants us to see because when we realize that we're taking upon ourselves worry, when we realize we're not the Christians we're supposed to be, then we can flee to Jesus, we can look to Jesus, and we can have Jesus, and then we don't have to worry. And we can have the life that God created us to enjoy. We can enjoy the life God designed us to have by giving us the mind, by giving us God's creation. All those things were given by God in order for us to enjoy life. Over and over and over, the scriptures talk about that. Especially 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19 text that we read last week. If you want to follow along in the sermon outline, I will give you a warning. It's going to go a little bit faster than normal through all of the, uh, the bullet points and the, the filling in the blank deals. But when I get to the last blank, do not shut me out. 
I'm just getting warmed up. No, that's not true. I've got at least eight minutes at the end. So when you fill in the last blank, do not think, well, Pastor Keith's done. I can shut down. Um, please don't do that because I, I really want to challenge you in your thinking at the, at the very, very end. So when you fill in the last blank, how many of you are willing to, to stay alert for seven more or eight more minutes at the... Okay, half of you, well, then I'll, I'll just write off the other half. Here we go. If you want to follow along the sermon outline. What does Jesus have to say about worry, stress, and anxiety, the trifecta of American wellness disorders? We are killing, we are literally killing ourselves with our stress, with our anxiety, with our worry. So what does Jesus have to say that, about this? Answer, take a good, long, hard look at why you worry. Ask yourself, does really worry really do any good at all? Does it help you? Does it empower you? Worry is for pagans. Pagans throughout the scriptures is used as a term for unbelievers, for Gentiles, those who don't know the Lord. Worry is for pagans who do not know the Lord. If you know God, you're going to know peace. If in your life there is no God, then there's no peace. And Jesus wants you to live life in its, to its fullest. John 10.10, 10, Jesus promises he wants us to have life in all of its abundance. And we rob ourselves of life by taking upon ourselves responsibility that God never intended for us to have. I remember the first time that that phrase got put in my brain by a man by the name of Bill Gothard in a seminar that I took in Chicago when I was a senior in high school. My mom and dad shipped me off to Chicago to take this seminar with a bunch of college students from uh, Huntington College. And I felt weird going there, but folks, that phrase has been with me since way back, I think it was November or December of 1971. Worry is taking upon yourself responsibility God never intended for you to have. There is only one omnipotent being. You're not it. You're severely underqualified. So why do we worry about the weather when you have absolutely no control over it at all? There is only one omniscient being who knows all. That's the God of the universe. It's not you. So why do you worry about world affairs? Why do you worry about what's going to happen? You don't even know the truth about all those things. This is good stuff, Pastor Keith. I know because I'm preaching it to me and I had to go through it this week. I sat there. Tuesday, I absolutely was, my life was undone. Why? Because I took my eyes off Jesus and I started to take upon myself responsibility for affairs and decisions and ideas and attitudes and all sorts of things that I have no control over at all. And my life was and I have a permanent debt in my dashboard to prove it. You're wondering, what? Ah! Lucky it wasn't four inches up, otherwise a poof. Oh, sorry. Now see what I've done? Now I do have something to worry about. See, the whole world comes unglued because of our worry. Sorry, Chris. Boy, have we created memories now. Word for the day is worry. It's deadly. It kills our spirit. It kills our bodies. It kills our minds. It occupies energy and sucks us dry where it shouldn't at all. The world's cure for anxiety is drugs and a shrink. God's cure for anxiety is himself. All we need to do is come into the presence of God, realize who he is and what he does and how much he loves us, and our worries would go away. Now, listen, I need to give this little disclaimer. There is such a thing as legitimate worry, legitimate concern. Let's use that word. That might be better to use two words. If you're, uh, if you're an architect and you're building a skyscraper that's uh, 
110 stories tall, and there's going to be thousands of lives depending upon your uh, math in order to make sure that your building's going to hold together, and you get up in the middle of the night questioning your figures, you ought to be concerned to go back and check those figures to make sure that building's going to hold up. I regularly go through my message from the time that it's completed on Thursday noon until uh, Sunday morning when I preach it, and I go over it and go over it and go over it and go over it, and I, I'm like the Holy Spirit brooding over the deep because I, I just, I want to make sure it's going to be right. Because why? Because it's crucially important that I communicate as accurately and as clearly and as effectively as I can what God has to say because it's important stuff. His words are life. It's better than any drug that you can buy at the pharmacy. And if I could communicate it clearly, I can actually keep a lot of you, not I, but the Word of God can keep a lot of you out of the hospital, out of the doctor's office. Why? Because you're trusting God and not worrying. Okay, what does Jesus have to say about worry? Number one, God gives us life. In spite of the fallen world syndrome, the FWS, thanks buddy, He'll provide for us his investment. Buddy is the one that came up with the fallen FWS, the fallen world syndrome. Do you do understand that in this world you will have trouble? It said it at the end of this. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus isn't denying that there's trouble. Of course there's trouble. It's a fallen world. But God has overcome the world. We can be more than conquerors by trusting in Christ. Look what he has to say. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Verse 26, are you not much more valuable than they, than the flowers and the birds? How much more will he clothe you, verse 30? Oh, you of, oh, you've heard that part before. Worry is taking upon yourself responsibility that God never intended for you to have. And it's killing us. This is what uh, uh, Dr. Charles Mayo, I, I, I don't know if you have heard the Mayo Clinic. Really? Probably, now let's try this again. Okay, audience participation is everything for a pastor because it means you're, you're not asleep if you're getting your hand up, which is crucial for me because I've, I've always thought people learn better when they're awake. So, <laughs> Dr. Charles Mayo had this to say. Worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system. Get this. I have never met a man or known a man to die of overwork, but I know of a lot of men who died of worry. People get on me all the time. Pastor Keith, you're working too hard. That's a bunch of hooey. I am invigorated when I'm able to do things that I feel is accomplishing something and making a difference in the world. I could do it all the time. I would have a hard time resting because that's what, I think that's what God has wired all of us to do is to make a difference in the world. Here's what really sucks the life out of me is for me to work hard for something and then I get, I get the idea that it didn't matter at all. That will kill me every time. That will suck the life out of me. The God of the universe wants you to understand that you can bring life to the world and that, that, that work is, is not something that's, to suck life out of you. Worry is what sucks the life out of you. Thinking that we don't matter, thinking that we don't have a difference. Did you hear about the guy that, that went into his doctor and he was having some symptoms that made him think that maybe he was going to die and said, Doc, am I going to die? And the doctor said to him, that's the last thing you're going to do. I'm glad to know you're all still here with me. <laughs> Listen, that doesn't relieve worry. But Jesus can. Number two, God provides for mere birds and flowers. He'll certainly provide for the pinnacle of his creation. Now listen, folks. This rubs against much of our culture. Because much of our culture says that we're no different than the flowers, we're no different than the deer, we're no different than the whales, we're no different than the dolphins, we're no different than the rest of the created order. That's a bunch of hooey. The God of the universe says, man is the one that I made the, the top of my created order a little lower than the angels and the, and the archangels. 
But of the created order here on earth, in the physical realm, you're the top rung. By God's design. And God made man to take dominion of this world. He put us in charge. Genesis chapter 2, uh, Psalm chapter 8, several other places throughout the scriptures. You are special to God. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? The obvious answer that Jesus expects you to say is, of course. But in 21st century America, that's not such an obvious answer anymore because these PETA people are telling us, no, you're all the same. The flowers, the birds, everything is just all created. We're all just evolutionary whatever. Verse 28, why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, and I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? You were created and designed to live forever. And Jesus is assuming that his audience understands that. We even know that in our, in our psyche. We dream about living forever. We dream about the next world. We dream about how the next world is going to be free of pain, free of death, free of disease, a just world, a righteous world. You dream about it because it's true. We talked about it in Ecclesiastes, how God has placed eternity in our hearts. It's part of our psyche. It's part of the way we're wired. And Jesus is expecting all of us to answer, listen, just look at how God takes care of nature. Won't he take care of you, the pinnacle of his creation? The answer is, of course. But we miss it now because we believed a lie about how we came into being. I, the, this quote by John MacArthur, I don't think it's in your sermon outline. I want you to listen. No bird is created in the image of God or recreated in the image of Christ. No bird was ever promised airship with Jesus Christ throughout all eternity. No bird has a place prepared for him in heaven. And if God gives and sustains life for birds, will he not take care of us who are his children and who have been given all of these glorious promises? And the obvious answer is, of course. So why don't we trust? Why do we worry about these things? We forget. We don't remember the promises of God. Um, Professor Turner read, Do not be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. In petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which uh, transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Three, worry is useless. It's even worse than useless. It's destructive. Who of you, can wor- by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Actually, the reality is, by worrying, you will take hours off your life. I remember hearing a, a popular talk show host um, about 20 years ago, and he said this, if you regularly worry, it is the medical equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes every single day. So if you're dead set against smoking because of its health risks and you worry, boy, you're not going to like this. You're a hypocrite. (laughs) I'm sorry. I've looked on um, WebMD, the website that talks about health issues and stuff. Um, This last uh, Thursday, went to webmd.com and looked under stress-related illnesses. I did not know this, but this is the top 10 stress-related illnesses. Heart disease, asthma, obesity, diabetes, headaches, depression, gastrointestinal, Alzheimer's, accelerated aging, and death. You don't think this topic is current and, and relevant? Nothing could be more relevant than this. And why is Jesus taking more time to address the subject of worry than he does with actually murder and adultery combined? It's because he knows it's robbing us of life. 
And he came and died to give us life in all of its abundance. And this is a very, very crucial aspect of being able to retrieve that life. That's why your memory verse for today is from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Number four, worry about food and clothing is for pagans. It's for unbelievers. It's for people who don't know Jesus. That's what he says in verse 32. Verse 31 and 32. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. I want to make this quote by that uh, really, really well-renowned theologian, Dieta Trainer. She said this. This is at a Wednesday night Bible study. I don't know. Do you remember saying this? She said this. Worry is telling God, God, you can't be trusted with these circumstances. Do you really want to tell the God of the universe that? God, I need to worry because I can't trust you. Really? Really? You trust yourself more than the God of the universe? You who brings absolute huge pain and suffering and all sorts of really unwise decisions into your life because of the things you think and the things you do and the things you say and you don't trust God who was willing to die for you? I want to read this quote by uh, Tim Keller. It's from a sermon called, of all things, Worry. (laughs) This is what he has to say. By definition, to forget God is to assume the place of God in your life and world. Now, what's bad about that? Oh my goodness, think about that for a second. What you do, what you do think worry, what do you think worry is? Let me tell you what worry is. Worry is a frustrated aspiration to omniscience. Worry is saying exactly what James says we cannot say. You are eaten up with worry to the degree you say, I know what's going on. I know what tomorrow holds. I know what is right. I know what has to happen. I know how history should go. Now, if you say that, you will be eaten up with worry because you are aspiring to omniscience. That is absolutely brilliant. Because, folks, we worry because we take upon ourselves responsibility that God never intended for us to have because we're unqualified for the job. You don't even know what's going to happen 30 minutes from now. Hopefully we'll be leaving this building. (laughs) And you're hoping we're going to be leaving this building. (laughs) I don't know what's going to happen. I have all the intentions of the world. I have all the plans in the world to go from here and go see my son preach in uh, Hamilton, Michigan, a little south of, of Holland, because he's preaching tonight and I have a free evening and I'm hoping to go hear him preach. But folks, there's two hours of driving between here and there. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know, maybe Gene will fall asleep and we won't even ever come back. Maybe we're going to stop and pick up somebody and they're going to say, oh, thanks so much. Here's $5 million for taking care of me. (laughs) Then we can build a new section in between. I don't know what's going to happen. And you know what? If my plans are interrupted... It'll be a chance for me to look myself in the mirror and say, did I think that I had control over the future that because my plans were interrupted, now I've failed? Or do I trust the God of the universe to interrupt my plans because he had something better in mind for me? I can't tell you how many times what I looked at as an absolute disaster, the God of the universe turned around to be the greatest event in my life. I've told you several times about how it really hurt when the the church in Addison voted me out of the the position as pastor over there because I didn't get the vote of confidence that I needed to get. We don't have one here. (laughs) Actually, we do. It just just happens a different way. But it, it absolutely devastated me. And you know what? I've, 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 boy, I hope the people in Addison don't listen to this part, but 
I've absolutely been thrilled to be here ever since. Because this, this church is a perfect fit for me. And I was kicking and screaming when I left over there, all the way out. You know why? Because I thought I knew what was best for my future. And God went, oh, don't be a baby. Just give me three months. Now, I know sometimes it takes longer than three months in order for God to reveal his plan. But I want to tell you, God has a habit of taking the biggest disasters of your life and turning them around to your biggest triumphs if he'll, you'll let him. So many times we wrink it out of God's hand and say, you don't know what you're doing. And then we go on our way and God goes, oh, I'll keep trying. Well, that Porter character, he's really trying to buck against me. I wish he'd just trust me. He worries way too much. Okay, conclusion. What is Jesus' remedy for such a widespread illness? A, seek God's kingdom and his righteousness first and foremost. Don't seek after things. Now, a lot of you, some of you are thinking about this and saying, well, what about work? And what about, should I worry about my work? And should I worry about earning income? Of course, God told you to. That's part of seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. The sparrows don't sit in the, in the, in the tree going <laughs> and expecting Pastor Keith to come out there and climb the tree and go, here, Bernie. Now, my wife is absolutely faithful in providing bird seed for the birds. The stupid squirrels get more of it, but she's faithful <laughs> to provide bird seed for the birds. But they still fly up and they get it and they take it back to their nests. Because they worry, they don't worry, they go out and seek and do the work in order to provide for themselves. We know why? Because God created them that way. The same is true with us. We're not to just sit back and go, wow, don't, don't worry, be happy. Somebody will take care of me. No! You're not seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. He wants you to be productive. He wants you to be like him. And providing for the world and taking care of those who can't take care of themselves and know it. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will take care of themselves. Boy, there was a really a, a astounding statistic that came across the news several years ago that I listened about Korean uh, high school students getting ready to go into college. Apparently, at the end of their, uh, their term of uh, high school, they have to take an exam that will basically plot the course of their life for the rest of their life. It'll determine which college they get into, it'll determine which career they get into, it'll determine what their income's going to be. And so they're required to take this exam that basically plots their life out for the, for the rest of their lives. Do you realize that every year, as Korean high school students are getting ready to take that exam, 300 of them, every year, 300 of them commit suicide? And 12,000 every year, as they're approaching this exam, run away from home, just to avoid it. That is a misunderstanding of God and his providence and God and his provision and God and his care and his love for you. You don't think the God of the universe can work through a silly exam in order to get you where you need to go? Of course he can! Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. B, trust God one moment at a time. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Why in the world would you bring today that which is crippling you already, and make it doubly. That's why I like, like the, don't worry, be happy. Now your troubles are double. Mark Twain. It's in your sermon outline. I've had many troubles in my life. Most of them I've never experienced. <laughs> Haven't you found that to be true? I know of people, I, I, it happens every time a storm appears in the West. I know of people who call me up on Tuesday, desperately concerned about how they're going to get into church on Sunday, 
because of some storm that's happening out in Denver someplace. And I want to play this song. <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. I, I, Pastor Keith, you listen to this message. Corrie Ten Boom, lady who spent time in a, a German concentration camp, said this. It's in your sermon outline. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. I know of a parishioner. Didn't get, ask him to, if I could have permission to say his name, but I know of a parishioner who was struggling with high blood pressure. And he was uh, really wrestling with this verse and this concept and thought, God, I really believe my high blood pressure is a result of worrying, not because of some chemical disorder in my body. And so he prayed to God and asked God whether or not when his medicine for his high blood pressure ran out, whether he should just not continue to take it and trust God. That's what he did. He just ceased to take his medicine once the prescription ran out and he went eight months without taking his medicine. Went back to the doctor, and the doctor said, Whoa, your blood pressure is way down. Keep up the good work. Keep taking the medicine. And he said, um, I haven't taken the medicine for eight months. I decided to just trust God and allow him to take care of my situation, and my blood pressure has been down ever since. And the doctor basically said, Well, it's obviously working, so keep doing whatever you're doing. Folks, trust God one moment at a time. Don't heap upon yourselves troubles and burdens that's going to make your life heavy. Be one. God owns all. He's the one that's calling the shots. Trust him. Be two. God controls all. You don't. Don't try to be God by thinking that you control other people, you control the weather, you control the economy. It's part of what we talked about last week about investments. Folks, I don't know if the investments that I have in my retirement are going to be there or not. I know one that I've given up on since about the 1980s, ever since I started putting money into it. <laughs> it's Social Security. I just, I just really don't, I'm not counting on it. If I get something, but I'm not counting on it because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't control the economy. I don't control the future. I don't control American economics. But I know someone who does, and he loves me. There was one time a guy who was applying for a job. I've seen these applications take place. It's absolutely amazing how some people view employment. But this guy was applying for a job. And he was filling out his form and laid out all the descriptions because it was a highly skilled and highly professional job. And the guy didn't have any experience, didn't have any training, no education, was underqualified, had no qualifications for the job at all. But on his form, he said, I need 30% more wages than what you're offering. And the employer looked at the resume and his job application and said, wait a minute. You have no experience for this job. You have no skills for this job. You have absolutely no education in this job, and yet you're asking for 30% more in order to, for you to be hired for this job? How can you even think that way? And the, the person filling out the application well said, don't you understand? It's a lot more stressful if you're working at a job that you don't know anything about. Do you really want to run the world? Do you really think you're qualified? Worry and stress is putting upon yourself responsibility God never intended for you to have. B3. Not only does God own all and con control all, God provides all. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. 
My worship point is this. Worship the God of the universe who is so powerful, so knowledgeable, so loving, forgiving, kind, compassionate, merciful, gracious, that we don't even have to worry. We don't ever have to worry. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. My gospel application is this. The good news of the gospel is that all the promises of God are made possible through faith in Jesus. There's a passage in Corinthians that talks about that. Having faith in Jesus is... In fact, in faith in Jesus, we need never worry again. By having faith in Jesus, we need never worry again. My spiritual challenge is this. Don't worry. Be happy. You can be happy when you recognize your poverty of spirit, you're mourning over your sinfulness, and you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Because when you come to that point, for then it means you can never, no longer trust yourself for your salvation, but you must trust Christ and have faith in the promises he has for those who believe. Are you not happy but fearful and anxious? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? I want to read this little poem to you. And I want to know why the birds are better at this than us. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. How can the sparrows live their lives carefree and worry-free and stress-free when we, created in the image of God, we, who have all this ability to think, worry ourselves literally to death? That's a sad commentary on where we are at. Here's my last little bit. I got six more minutes. You filled in the last blank. I've already used two. I still have six more. I want to read this para, uh, a passage of scripture from Luke chapter 8. The disciples fell asleep in a boat, and as a squall came on the lake, so the boat was swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples woke Jesus and said, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Jesus got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and the storm subsided and everything was calm. Then Jesus asked his disciples, where is your faith? That is a loaded question. Because I think there are four different ways we can look at that question. One, where is your faith? In other words, what is the object of your faith? Is it God? Or is it in yourself? If it's in yourself, then you've got every reason in the world to be scared when you're in a boat on the Sea of Galilee when a raging storm is coming up because lots of sailors have lost their lives in the Sea of Galilee with those storms. It's one of the things they tell you on the tour when you're going through, the, uh, through Israel on the, on the tour. So what is the object of your faith? Where is your faith? Two, have you lost your faith? Where is your faith? You, you certainly had it one time. Where did, you, where did you put it? Three, why don't you apply your faith? Where is your faith? Think about what you're saying. Think about what you're involved in. Think about what it's going to take in order for you to make it through this crisis that you find yourself in. Where's your faith? Why don't you apply it? Then finally, where's your faith? Let's look at it and examine it and see what it's all about. Because folks, if you have faith, you can look at the most stressful situation and really see it in a way that can, what James says, allow you to rejoice. Romans chapter 5, James chapter 1, several places in the scriptures talk about how we can actually have joy when we're facing what should be highly stressed situations. John Flavel, the uh, Puritan, says that God's providences are best read backwards like Hebrew words. You know Hebrew reads from right to left instead of left to right. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is a bad illustration for everybody. But I would encourage you to understand this. Do you know what stressed is backwards? Desserts. 
We need to look back on the providences of God in our lives. We need to look back on the providences of God in the life of Israel. We need to look backwards on the providences of God throughout the Scriptures. In fact, I was reading through the book of Psalms uh, for my devotions in the last several weeks, and over and over and over again, the the Psalms ask us to recall the, the works of God, what He's done for us. Why? Because when you look back, you can be rest assured that He'll take care of you. We need to look at, our, look at our stressed out situations looking back and now see them as desserts. Because that's what the God of the universe wants to bring you. Real quickly, as before I close and bring Pastor Dave up, if you're a believer and you're stressed out, shame on you. If you're not a believer, you should be stressed out. You should be. Your hope is in you? You against the world? You against all these things in the economy? You against the medical community? Good luck with that. And if today you realize that the God of the universe wants you to live a life not of worry, but of happiness... I'd encourage you to come to Jesus because he can do exactly that. Let's pray. Father, help us to trust in you with all of our hearts. Help us not to lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways to acknowledge you. Father, if there is someone here today who for the first time may have realized what your son Jesus has actually done in order to give us life, I pray that they would come to a better understanding of all that Jesus has done that gives us life in all of its abundance. And Father, help us as Christians that when we begin to worry that we would take inventory of our lives and hear the words of Jesus in the question when he asked the disciples, where is your faith? And that we would take inventory of that question in our own hearts, in our own lives, and trust you. In Jesus' name we pray.